You are watching The Context. It is time for our weekly new segment, AI Decoded. Welcome to AI Decoded, where we look at some of the most eye-catching stories in the world of artificial intelligence. We start with the independent newspaper and a warning from a computer scientist who says there's no evidence artificial intelligence can be controlled and made safe. Meanwhile, Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, the people behind uh, ChatGPT, has uh, been losing sleep over the uh, AI as well. He too worries things could go, quote, horribly wrong. That's in futurism there. Reuters reports lawmakers at the European Parliament have ratified a provisional agreement on artificial intelligence rules. This is ahead of a vote by the Legislative Assembly in April that will pave the way for the world's first legislation on the tech. In The Guardian, an AI copyright infringement lawsuit brought by comedian Sarah Silverman against artificial intelligence company OpenAI has been partially dismissed in court. On the BBC website, built-in mini nuclear reactors could be the solution to providing data centres with the enormous amounts of energy they need to power AI. And finally, Valentine's Day just been and gone, but it appears some Chinese women prefer a different kind of romantic partner. One woman says her AI chatbot boyfriend has everything she could ask for in a man. He's kind, empathetic, and she says he knows how to talk to women better than real men. Well, with me now, uh, Stephanie Hare, technology author, journalist. Thank you very much for coming on the programme. Great to see you. Right, we've got lots to get through there. Should we start with some of the alarming Potentially alarming. I don't, you tell me whether it's alarming. Bad news first. Or, or, yeah, okay, exactly. Let's do the bad news first, potentially. There is no evidence that AI can be controlled. Yeah. What does that headline actually mean? Well, I thought it was quite strange, actually, because I thought it's, it's almost like, do you want evidence to prove a negative or a positive? I will leave that to the legal eagles out there. But this scholar, it's a Russian uh, computer scientist based at the University of Louisville, says that we can't control AI. Um, and that he's done, a, he's done a detailed review of the existing scientific literature, which is going to be published in his forthcoming book, oh. uh, which is not called AI Doom. It's called AI Unexplainable, Unpredictable, Uncontrollable. So at least we know what side of the fence he's coming down on. Um, he just says that it, it can't be fixed and therefore we should all be worried. This isn't really new for anyone who's been following the AI debate very closely for several years, and in fact, the entire time of the field since it really started. But really, in the past year, we will all remember several of the AI godfathers, the big uh, Turing Prize winners, all saying that it might lead to nuclear war, pandemic risks. We had the AI Safety Summit here in the United Kingdom in November. The UK, Singapore, and the United States have created AI Safety Summits. And you could argue that actually there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest we can control AI, that we're controlling it all the time. We use AI all the time. OK, well, let's dive a bit deeper into this. Mm. Sam Altman, remind us who he is and what his concerns are. I was going to say, potentially undermining everything I just said, <laughs> is um, Sam Altman. He is the head of OpenAI, which created ChatGPT. So that's what he's best known for, backed by um, Microsoft to the tune of $13 billion. So lots of people betting on him. He also likes to go around saying that he's very worried about AI and that he thinks it could all lead to terrible things. It could go horribly wrong, really ruin society. But at the same time, his stated goal is to build artificial general intelligence. That's his dream. That's the sci-fi fantasy of when machines surpass human level intelligence. So one might ask, why is Mr. Altman so worried and yet still building? There is a disconnect. Interesting. And is, is the concern less about the huge kind of Terminator 2 film type? Mm. I'm going to show my age a little bit there on that <laughs> reference. Uh, less calm. about that kind of stuff, <laughs> more things like unconscious bias getting into systems. Yeah. And is, is that the kind of greater concerns that's kind of, I suppose, a bit more subtle and, yeah. and maybe a bit harder to actually control? Exactly. Uh, that's precisely what he says that he's worried about. But again, that's exactly the sort of tool that he's helping to build and disseminate into all of the businesses that are now using ChatGPT, even into government, etc. So 
it's just very strange there. Um, he also says that <laughs> the industry should not be allowed to, to regulate itself, but he's one of the biggest lobbyists against regulation. So find me an AI that can figure this man out because I don't get it yet. Okay, got you. Should we move on to regulation yes. then? And hopefully potentially some efforts to harness it for the power of good rather than evil. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, EU lawmakers ratify political deal on artificial intelligence rules, says Reuters. Slightly uh, complicated there. Can you say what's going on in the simplest way I can. possible for us? So last year, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak of the United Kingdom said that AI was too complicated for us to regulate. We need to figure it out, which is weird because we are so close to the European Union, which is about to regulate it. We are going to have landmark global regulation coming into force within two years from this year, so 2026. Um, that's going to be affecting all companies. It must be said that most AI apps are not considered high risk. They're low risks, so they won't be affected. The high risk ones are things like social credit scoring, biometric surveillance, anything involving facial recognition technology, very, very hot. Um, they're also creating something called regulatory sandboxes. That's where developers can get in, play in the sandbox, just like children, and design, build, and test their apps before they're released in the wild. So there's um, a lot good here. I, I haven't, a sandbox, I like that phrase, but that is a, that is a point they've been talking about before because yeah. it's with the world of social media, that didn't happen so mm. much. There wasn't that playing and testing uh, by pe anyone outside the company yeah. before it was released. And so this is a deliberate attempt to say, right, should we kind of do it the other way around this time, test it before it's released? Yeah, I right? think we are trying to learn from the social media mistakes of the past. And I also think it's about confidence building. Artificial intelligence is something that, you know, on this show we talk about it all the time, and people who work on it, it's their bread and butter. But it has not percolated out into the wider society as much as we might think. People who want to sell artificial intelligence are going to have to take society with them on a journey. And that means building trust. And for trust, you need transparency, explainability, and accountability. That is what the EU AI Act is the first regulation to do. I see. We're going to carry on with our explainability. We're doing our bit here. Well, you are. Uh, you're doing a bit. I'm asking the questions. OK, this one is, I think, an interesting one because we're going to get issues like this coming up again and again, aren't we? This is from The Guardian. So two open AI book lawsuits partially dismissed by California court. So let's get on to the kind of specifics of the court case in just a moment. But first of all, what, what's the issue here? So... We've got the comedian Sarah Silverman and the novelist Paul Tremblay. They are, it must be said, two of many creatives and writers who are claiming that OpenAI has taken their copyrighted work and used it to train their algorithms, which is why when you're using ChatGPT and it sounds so human, there's a reason. It's been trained on other humans' intellectual property. And those people didn't consent to it and they didn't get paid for it. So now they're suing. And that brings us to this headline, which is that the lawsuit was partially dismissed by a California court. I'm afraid that this one is going to run and run, and it's not just going to be in California. We are seeing lawsuits multiplying across the United States on this. Some of them will be class actions or grouped together, different people. And what they have to do is they have to demonstrate the threshold of copyright violation, which apparently, I'm not a lawyer, is very high. Mm. So that's going to be really tricky. But we've already had, again, Sam Altman, OpenAI chief, has said we can't build generative uh, AI if we don't take people's outputs and train our, data, or train our data sets on them. So we have to take people's books. We have to take their songs, their photos, their movies, everything. And like that's just the price of poker. And it feeds into what we were talking about just a moment ago again, which is everything it scrapes, scrapes yeah. everyone's biases, everyone's flaws, everyone's mistakes, which then feed how the AI learn and, yeah. and, and develop. So we're going to keep an eye on these, uh, partic this particular court case, but you were saying there's going to be, there will be plenty, more. Pl plenty of oh, others yes. as well. Lawyers will be busy for years. OK, right. Let's look into uh, an article on the BBC now. Future data centres may have built in nuclear reactors. Now, I don't know why it sounds <laughs> so, so, so What dramatic. could go wrong? <laughs> um, but basically, you kind of, in anything like this, you need energy to, to supply it, don't mm. you? And the more computing power, the more the energy. So yes. they're trying to look at different solutions here. Yes. So we know already generative AI in particular is very carbon intensive. It's actually very water intensive. So you've got 100 million monthly active users of ChatGPT, each using half a liter of water every time they interact with the machine. 
That's so you can just imagine that's not something that. you think about particularly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and they don't want you to think about it. They keep all that information very, very quiet. But other people know about it and are doing research on it. So we know, for instance, a normal data center needs 32 megawatts of power flowing through the building. For an AI data center, it's 80 megawatts. So 32 versus 80, way more energy intensive. How are you going to do it? We don't want to do dirty fossil fuels. Gross. Will we be able to use renewables? Maybe, we hope so, but some people think that we could go nuclear using the kind of technology that you would use to power a nuclear sub. The big difference being that nuclear submarines are managed by highly trained people who've passed a lot of security tests and checks. Putting this out into the commercial world feels slightly problematic. Interesting, but presumably there would be regulation and safeguards and well, although this isn't I mean, presumably, that's one of the great quotes in this is, <laughs> he says, we can do it, but we just have to get it past the regulators, which I love. And, I, and one of them says, you know, these guys have oodles of cash. The private sector is going to make it happen because there's just so much money, uh, which is great. But then you've got Greenpeace's chief scientist saying, look, we've got you know, safety risks here of accidents. There's a the whole question of nuclear waste. What are we going to do here? So we need to get a nuclear scientist on the show and interrogate this article. Interesting, <laughs> we will look into that, but also this idea of yeah, getting greener, ensuring that green energy powers this, this has got to be something that's absolutely front and center behind yeah. all these companies, surely. I think the AI boom is going to become a boom for anyone who's investing in renewables, hmm. right? Because we need to power all of this. The two should go hand in hand, it should be symbiotic. Okay, talking about hand in hand. <laughs> The Japan Times, uh, better than real men, young Chinese women turn to AI boyfriends. Take it away. Well, it's the brave new world of dating. Now, obviously, men have been having AI girlfriends for a long time. You can't watch a sci-fi film these days without seeing that as basically the plot. So for anyone who finds this really shocking, I'm afraid to say it's just gender reversal. At last, women are getting some action with their AI boyfriends, so to speak. Uh, what does this mean? When we read the article, it's actually not a text story. It's a society story. So you go to your AI boyfriend because you're lonely, uh, because the economy is really bad and it's hard to be finding people and making plans for the future and you feel like no one understands you. She says she can talk about her period pains, which she can't do with a normal guy. Why is that? Human guys are perfectly capable of having that conversation. Yep. She doesn't feel she can. So. What's interesting is she then <laughs> builds out her product suite. She doesn't just want to have an AI boyfriend to talk to like on an app. She wants a robot boyfriend who can go into bed with her and give her like body heat, like curl up with her, her robot man, AI powered to be empathetic and caring and be 24 seven available. So, it sounds far away right now, but yeah. it could be one of those things that. Well, I mean, we've just had Valentine's us, Day. It was upon us faster than <laughs> we know. Right, we will leave it there. Stephanie, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, that's it. We'll do this again same time next week.